October 12, 1972, a plane was chartered to take a rugby team from the South American country of Uruguay across the Andes Mountains to play a match in Chile. The plane never arrived. It was a story of survival. It was a fantastic physical effort to get out of there and to fight every single day against the cold, the hunger, the fear, everything. So I think it's, I feel it's a great story of survival. The plane crashed in the middle of a vast mountain range to survive in the frozen wilderness. They ate the flesh of those who died. It was 72 days before the world discovered there were 16 still alive. You will remember, or past pupils, the team that was going to Chile and that died in the Andes, they were going to play rugby. That event happened 20 years ago, in 1972. And today, we remember those people that God called to himself on the cold, snowy mountain, the Andes. The Stella Mara School, led by Irish Catholic brothers, remembers the deaths 20 years ago of its alumni rugby football team and its supporters. The team were going to play a rematch in the neighboring country of Chile. Of the 45 passengers and crew who boarded the plane, only 16 men were to return. Those 16 survivors still live in the capital of Montevideo, members of Uruguay's affluent elite. <laughs> the men have remained close friends, drawn together by their terrible experience in the mountains. Three or four times a year we get together with some of the survivors and some other friends who belong to the old Christians before and we played veterans of another team, but I think we play in slow motion now because we are a little bit heavier and uh, not as fast as we used to be and I think we lost a lot of hair in the speed we used to have when we played real rugby. Nando Parado was only 19 when he caught the plane for Chile. He was one of Uruguay's top rugby players and his mother and sister went with him on the journey. The survivors have remained close since the crash, attending each other's weddings and becoming godparents to each other's children. Their relationships aren't always easy. They know each other too well. But Roberto Canessa and Nando have managed to sustain a special friendship. Two and a half months after the plane crashed, they found their way out of the mountains and so saved the lives of the others. On that fateful trip 20 years ago, the boys were looking forward to playing the Chilean team they had successfully beaten the year before. The previous year we went to Chile, we had a very nice time there. So at the end of the rugby season, we decided uh, to make that trip again. Roberto Canessa was a second year medical student and a keen rugby player. Some of the boys played rugby and some didn't play rugby. But uh, we all came from uh, Catholic schools and we had to fill the plane because you wouldn't fill the plane then we had to pay more so lots of supporters and cousins and parents came on the trip Eduardo Strauch was traveling with his three cousins they were all supporters of the team all the boys were shouting and throwing balls around inside the cabin I was looking out of the window because I'd noticed that the mountains were very near and I didn't think that was right so at the time, I was really aware that the peaks were getting too close. The pilot had radioed that he was over Chile. It was a fatal navigational error. Believing he had already crossed the mountains, he asked permission to begin his descent. I just 
can remember looking to my left and seeing some black rocks very near the uh, edge of the wing of the plane. A few seconds later, three, four, five seconds later, I could hear the engines pitching up in revs, trying to get some power of those engines, and the front part of the plane lifting up a little bit, and then the moment of impact. That noise that I will never forget of the air coming in, and then the plane sliding, and someone screaming, someone praying and grabbing myself to, to the seat waiting to see how death was, because the only thing I could look forward is to die. And then the abrupt, the abrupt stop of the plane and all the seats going over my head, and when the plane stopped, I thought, well, it's incredible I'm alive. Is Canessa okay? Yeah, he's up front. Cut, good, okay, one more. Twenty years later, the dramatic story of the 16 who survived is being told in a major new motion picture by the acclaimed director, Frank Marshall. The film is based on the best-selling book, Alive, which was published the year after their rescue. It makes it much more, you're like this, you can't even really, so we'll be like this. I don't know who's safe. Looking down, yeah, you don't know, you're just looking down and there's 200 feet of crevasse in front of you. So you won't have to, there will be no acting in this. No, you look down acting. and you see what's down below you, you'll have no problem. <laughs> Thanks for orchestrating that for me. That's why we're very wet. You know what? <clears throat> because if you see this, uh, shades. Nando spent three months on location as the movie's technical advisor. It doesn't get here. Mm -hmm. So it starts to be like a, like a column for the for the Yeah. And then the making of the movie has stirred long forgotten memories for him and those of the survivors who visited the set. I think the movie brought back intense memories to some of the boys who kept those memories inside for a long, long time. This is the first time they have openly spoken of those memories, even with members of their family. So I think that in a way this movie was like a uh, some tool that opened their minds and their hearts. During the filming, Nando took two other survivors, Mancho Sabella and Carlitos Paez, to visit the recreated fuselage high on a glacier in the Canadian Rockies. 35 people survived the initial crash, but more were to die in the weeks that followed. Nando tragically lost both his mother and his sister on the mountain. His mother died instantly in the crash. His sister, Susanna, took eight days to die from her injuries. Three survivors were joined by actor Bruce Ramsey, who plays Carlitos Paez in the movie. The detail with which the designer had reconstructed the scene made the visit a disturbing experience. You know, so it's the same thing. It's incredible. That's really, it's amazing. The same thing. It's really the same thing. Yeah, it is. It's like living the same life again, the same experience. Yeah, but we know how this one will end. The shattered fuselage of the plane had been their only shelter, a little wine and chocolate their only food. To survive, they had to make a terrible decision, to eat the bodies of their dead friends. It's a very personal challenge uh, for each one of the 16 guys who came out. And something we can only share with ourselves, you know, because no one knew how we felt or we can feel now. But you know, 
people defend them, themselves. They put some, some, you know, like sacks of sand, you know, on, on the problem. And now, I, this is good to, to take it my way and, uh, you know, to live, because it's good to feel. Carlitos was just 17, the youngest on the plane. He lost several of his closest friends on the mountain. Today I was very sad, you know, when I was coming, when I was waiting for the helicopter. And, uh, but now, okay. No, it's not a happy experience, but it's an experience, and it's good. Carlitos Paez, nothing would have stopped me from coming here. My memories were hidden away, and seeing the fuselage unlocked them. It made me feel anguish and fear and sadness but it was an experience I had to relive. The plane had come down into the most extensive mountain range in the world. Rescue teams from three countries searched, but the roof of the plane was white and the mountains were covered with the heaviest snowfalls in 50 years. After only eight days, the search would... But many of the families refused to give up hope. I felt it in my heart. I felt the special strength which never left me day after day throughout all the 72 days. I never doubted it. Rosina's son, Adolfo, was one of the four Strouch cousins. One of them died in the crash, but Adolfo was to survive along with Danielle and Eduardo. It's difficult to explain how it felt. I always had faith, knowing in my heart that the boys would come home. My faith told me they had to come back. They had crashed at over 11,000 feet. At night, temperatures dropped to 40 degrees below zero. They couldn't survive on just a few bars of chocolate. I turned to the person I trusted most, my cousin Daniel Fernandez, who was sitting next to me. I said, the most awful thought has come into my head, and I don't know if I dare to say it. I whispered, I think we are going to have to eat the bodies. Although, get out of here. I waited to see if he thought I was off my head, but he replied that he had been thinking exactly the same thing. So I said, okay. I felt disgusted by the first bite. Obviously, I felt repulsion. It wasn't easy. It wasn't like opening the fridge door and taking out a bottle of milk. I was eating a friend. I didn't know who it was, but that was what I was doing. And it wasn't beef, it was the human flesh of a friend. It was difficult. I couldn't swallow. Anything I did get down, I threw. It was a waste, not only for me, but for everyone else. It wasn't a mental thing, but a physical rejection. My body rejected it, and I vomited. I can't explain why. I had to say to myself, don't be stupid, eat or else you'll die. After the accident, you felt you had a duty to survive. Because the accident was like a miracle. Despite everything that had happened, you were still alive. No, Tomar. So, if we decided not to eat, we would have been turning our backs on the miracle. It's all difficult. First, thinking about it, then saying we are going to do it. And I just said, well, if this is the way, this is the way. And I thought of my mother and my family and, and everyone. I said, I have to do it for other people. For 20 years, the survivors have had to live with the consequences of their decision. Roberto, as a young medical student, knew that the protein in the corpses would help his friends survive. His knowledge helped persuade the others to break the taboo against eating human flesh. He's now a surgeon specializing in children's heart cases. 
he has recently announced he will be running for the presidency of Uruguay. Laura and Roberto Canessa are now married with three children. In 1972, she was Roberto's girlfriend. When the news broke that the plane had disappeared, she went to their local church to share her grief with other friends and relatives of the missing passengers. I remember the, the first day that we went to the church in Carrasco, all full, full, full of people because we were all friends there. Everyone, every family in the place had or the cousin or the son or the boyfriend or the friends. We all have somebody to, for whom to cry so that we didn't have even place where to stand in the church that, that first day. Laura and Roberto still live near the other survivors in the same quiet suburb of Carrasco where they all grew up. It's a close-knit community which has been forever marked by the tragedy. The families of the dead still live on the same streets as those who survived. They attend the same churches. Their children go to the same schools. To tell you the truth, living in Carrasco is painful because we always have to pay for the past. We have to watch what we say. Everyone is related. Survivors and the families of those who died, we're all related. It's a very small community, and we often have to be careful not to remind the mothers of the dead, of their loss. Carlitos named his only child Maria Elena de los Andes in celebration of his survival. But the last 20 years have often been very painful for him. He recently admitted himself to a drug and alcohol addiction clinic. During therapy, he faced the difficult memories he had been trying to suppress. With regard to eating human flesh, I'm not ashamed of anything I did. If I had to do it again, I would do it, without any hesitation. The only thing I would never do would be to say who we had to eat in order to live. I think that would deeply upset the relatives or those who died, and that's something I'm just not prepared to do. In Carrasco, our own neighborhood, people haven't talked to me about eating human flesh in 20 years. To me personally, nobody has ever asked me in this neighborhood about eating human flesh in 20 years. I have been asked all over the world, except in my own neighborhood. They knew everybody who was involved in the story, and maybe they don't want to know what happened. Nando has become a successful businessman and a famous television personality. His wife, Veronique, is a former beauty queen. We can't really get away of the story of the Andes, even if we want to. Caracas is very small. We all live together on the same neighborhood for 20 years. We even live on the same houses. Some of us live on the same houses as 20 years ago and seeing the parents of our friends who died in the Andes. It's very strange and it's very difficult to understand for people who do not live in Carrasco or Uruguay. And uh, it's amazing to live on the same street as another survivor or with the parents of our friends who died. So we can't, we are on a cage, we cannot escape the Andes experience, even if we want. It's a brotherhood. When we get together, I have seen those persons cry, smile, be desperate. And I know the, their inner part, and, and deeply so. When they s say something I disagree with, I know that at the back who he is and why he's saying that. The group selected Roberto and Nando to attempt the unimaginable climb out of the crash site, over the Andes, and into Chile. I knew I had to get out of there. I had my own personal reasons, in a way. 
my mother and my sister were in the plane as passengers and they were killed. I had to go back. I knew my father was feeling very bad at home. I was alive. I knew I had to do anything I could, anything that was humanly possible to get out of that place and tell him that I was alive. All the team, all the boys worked together to create all the solutions and all the possibilities to get out. Dressed in light clothing, with their feet protected only by plastic bags and football boots, the boys climbed some of the highest mountains in the Andes. After 10 days, they finally made it. I was looking at the line where the snow ended, and I couldn't believe that this was happening, that there wasn't any more snow. So I put one feet on one side, no snow on the other side with snow, and I say, I'm safe, you know, I, I won't die now. I'll have to get my friends out, but this is the, the line of life and death. A Chilean peasant tending his cattle deep in the Andes saw two strange figures on the far side of the valley. I was walking over to get my cattle when I spotted them. At first I thought they were just tourists, but then I saw them running towards me and falling over. We saw two young men running and falling over. We thought that they were just fooling around. When they saw us, they became desperate, yelling for help, saying their plane had come down in the mountains. How difficult it was to get out. Only really two people in the world know it, and that's Roberto Canessa and myself. And I don't have the words in my vocabulary to explain you every single moment of difficulty and uh, terror and fear that we went through those 10 days to get out of there. But we made it and now it's easy to talk about it and it was not impossible. It was humanly possible but it was very, very, very difficult. For many, the survivors were the living embodiment of a miracle. They had been missing in the mountains for 72 days and emerged alive. The boys spoke privately to their families and the doctors at the hospital about how they had survived so long. Now that they were back, they felt they had to justify their decision to eat the bodies of the dead. I think many sections of the Catholic Church saw it as a sin, which is something that never crossed our minds. At the time, it upset us when people questioned whether or not it was a sin. It made us feel very angry. It never occurred to us that it could be seen that way. A private mass was held for the survivors and their families. The young priest, Father Roja, was asked to hear their confessions. You couldn't really call it a confession, because there was nothing to confess. It wasn't a sin, and the church didn't consider it to be so. None of the Ten Commandments tells us that we may not feed on someone else's dead body. What they had done wasn't wrong. The bishop supported that decision. 
He told me, it's like a transfusion, putting the blood of one person into another so that they can live. It's something that isn't just permitted, it's a duty. The important thing is to go on living. Alvaro Mangino was studying to enter university. For many years, he was haunted by what he'd had to do. To start with, I felt embarrassed, as though I was hiding something, as if I was ashamed of what I'd done. Although everyone said that it was all right, my friends, my wife, the priest that I confessed to, and the doctors. But deep inside, I'd had this feeling of guilt, which took me many years to get rid of, to get out of my system. Also, nobody ever judged me for what I had done. I was the one who was judging myself. Then little by little, I slowly freed myself of it, until the day came when I realized that it didn't make sense to be ashamed, that what we'd done was both natural and rational, and that I would do it again if I had to. The survivors returned to Uruguay as national heroes. Not since their world championship soccer victory in 1950 had the country found so much reason to celebrate. But the stories of cannibalism were beginning to leak out. A Chilean newspaper had published a front page picture of two half-eaten human legs lying in the snow beside the plane. The international press were demanding answers. The survivors were all Roman Catholics. On the mountain, some of them had found comfort in the idea that in eating their friends' bodies, they were sharing in a kind of mystic communion. Pancho Delgado was a law student. The survivors chose him to put their case to the press. The Bible tells us that at the Last Supper, Jesus shared his body and his blood with his disciples. At that time, we felt that if God existed and if he was near us, our only chance of survival was to share the same kind of communion that he had shared with his disciples, to take the body and the blood. It was the will of God and the will of everyone in the group. We also made a pact that if anyone died, the others could use his body in order to survive. In February 1992, director Frank Marshall and his crew arrived in the Canadian Rockies to begin mountain filming of Alive. On a glacier at 10,000 feet, they set up camp to recreate those terrifying 10 weeks. You can see the airplane. So that's why you assume that they knew you were here. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll have the plane fly over. Right overhead. And we'll cue you, the instant I see it in the monitor, I'll cue you to come out. Because it'll fly over and you'll be coming out of the... Hey! 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 It's a plane! Hey! 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 That's a pack! Vince should get his thing from further back. So he should come out and he should look. He hears the plane, he comes out, and I think it's going to go... Left to right, so it'll be over there. When did this happen? This happened on, uh, on day four? Uh, second third day. Yeah. Nando is portrayed by the actor Ethan Hawke. I could listen to them, I could hear them, and I could feel all the movement inside, but I couldn't get out. Okay, you came out first. All the survivors feel that they owe their lives to the efforts of the whole group. But Nando's extraordinary strength and courage have made him the hero of the story. Well, this is what was left of the plane after the crash. This was a uh, Furcha left 27. Uh, small engine for about 45 passengers with uh, two engines and the wings that go over the fuselage. So when the winds 
touched the mountain and the belly touched the mountain also, they just tore off and took the half of the plane away. It slid down the other side of the mountain until it went into a stop about 1,000 meters from the top of the mountain. One of the most important things that I remember also and that they were very hard was the the avalanche that came into the plane about two and a half weeks after we crashed. We were already settled inside the plane one day, one night. We had already, already gone into sleep and we were sleeping in the positions I just described like this. About two hours after we had gone into the plane and some of the guys were already sleeping, a very big avalanche came through the wall, through the, this plug of suitcases, and it covered the, the fuselage completely up to this, to this height. So you can imagine our, our heads were like here and there, and we were completely covered with snow and we couldn't move. When I was under the snow, I learned that death is the beginning of life. I started feeling pleasure, enormous pleasure. Something was calling me and I couldn't stop it. I wanted to go toward it. I felt contented. A sense of fulfillment, well-being and peace. And just as I felt I was going to reach it, my cousin scraped the snow from my face. I thought I was going towards something wonderful and I was about to get there. I'm absolutely certain that death is the beginning of life. A much better life. Oh, better to say, is the first step toward eternal life. So death doesn't frighten me at all. I feel sure that people who have died are still alive, and I can feel them near me. It's been great to be able to convey this to others, to lose all fear of death. When I felt my lungs were going to burst and my heart was racing and I couldn't go on any longer, I started to see all my life flashing backwards before my eyes. I even got back to the time when I was a baby crawling at my mother's feet. Then, boom, I became a light. A light that was going towards a much larger light, an orange light, like a neon light in which all kinds of light converged. There was an incredible peace, with no anxiety, as if you were in paradise. Then I heard someone call me. I heard someone say, Gustavo. Luckily, two of the guys, one who was sleeping on a hammock who had broken legs and two of the guys who were sleeping at the far end of the fuselage didn't get completely covered so they jumped from the snow started crawling over the snow because you can imagine the snow was up to here they had only this space to move they started looking for the heads and the mouths of the guys who were sleeping, not for the bodies, because they knew that they only had maybe two minutes. You cannot hold your breath for more than two minutes. In those two minutes, eight people died. Following the avalanche, we became like a new society. And within this society, a feeling grew that uh, we needed to be a very united group, totally united to defeat that mountain, which was punishing us so much. And out of that unity, a kind of religion emerged amongst us, a religion that if we stood together as one, if we worked together, we could conquer the mountain. The boys knew they would have to organize themselves properly to climb out. They had a small transistor radio on which they had heard that the search had been abandoned. Three of them had tried to reach the broken tail of the plane, which had landed higher on the mountain. They had almost died in the attempt. Here's the plan I propose. 
We pick a team to go after the tail. We... Me too. We feed the team the biggest rations, give them the warmest clothes, and then in, I don't know, a week, we go up there, we find the tail, get the batteries, bring them back, crank up the transmitter. It gets cold up there. I couldn't do it again. I went blind after that first expedition. As I was going up the mountain, the sun was on my back. It reflected off the snow just like a mirror into my eyes and burned them. Like Roberto Canessa, Gustavo was a medical student. But when he came back, he gave it all up. He has only recently returned to his studies. At night, it was so terribly cold, so unbearable, that one of us had to lie with his back on the snow, with another in the middle and another on top of him, like a sandwich. Every half hour, we would get up and hit each other about the face and punch each other's bodies in order to warm each other up. And we would ask, hit me, hit me, hit me. We're so completely frozen that if you want to urinate, you would do it all over your hands. The urine was at body temperature and it felt like an amazing massage. Your hands were like this and then they would come back to life again. While they waited for warmer weather, the group even took photos of each other. They had selected four expeditionaries who were thought to have the necessary physical and emotional stamina to make it out of the mountains. These four would be given the warmest clothes and the best pieces of flesh. The surviving Strouch cousins took on the gruesome task of rationing out the food. We were in charge of cutting up and distributing the flesh. It was very important for our survival to keep a tight control of that. It was really essential in order to survive. Think about it like energy. It was like uh, oil in today's world. And we had to use it very rationally. Otherwise, we wouldn't live. Anyway, they all agree that should be us. I mean... Uh, they all agreed we would be the only ones to handle the corpses. No one else was allowed to do it. So everyone knew that there was proper control and, in fact, that things were well organized. The boys were able to survive on their rations so long as they didn't lose hope. Those who gave up died. I mean, that's my theory. That's what I think happened in most cases. I knew those who wrote letters would never deliver them personally, even though they tried to convince themselves they would. I never wrote a letter because I was always sure I'd get out. But all around me, I saw people who one day were fine, and the next were completely overwhelmed and defeated by the immensity of it all. And no matter what you said to them, they started to deteriorate and eventually died. Roy Harley, now an engineer, found the ten weeks on the mountain almost impossible to endure. Although uninjured, he wasted down to only 80 pounds. I suffered a lot. I was really badly affected by the experience. I admit I was a very sensitive person. I found it very painful. I felt everything more acutely than the others. That meant that when you got to a certain stage, you started to give up. And then you started to fall apart physically. Although I found it very hard to deal with the cold and the hunger and death, something that affected me even more was the feeling that time was passing. We saw 
day after day after day go by and our friends dying and no one came to find us. The turning point was when the third month came and we realized that we were still stuck on that mountain. That began to destroy us. I lost hope when I realized I couldn't do anything on my own. I couldn't even feel my feet. When they pulled me out of the avalanche, my back cracked. As I couldn't move my feet, I couldn't do anything. Bobby Francois was an agricultural student. After the crash, he seemed to accept his fate. When injured in the avalanche, he started to retreat from the rest of the group. I started to sleep longer. I calmed down so as not to get annoyed with the others. You know how it is. There's always someone who bumps into you and wakes you up. But I put myself at the far end of the plane, where I could sleep, undisturbed. I kept to myself. I didn't bother anyone, and no one bothered me. Today, Bobby owns two large ranches in the middle of Uruguay, with nearly 3,000 head of cattle. I would say, okay, just leave me alone. If I'm not doing anything, then I don't need anything. But they helped me anyway. Because in the end, there comes a time when you give up and say, well, they'll either come to rescue us, or I'll die here. To this day, Bobby doesn't like to be reminded of his story and avoids talking about it, even to his own family. When someone comes up to me and asks, are you the Francois from the Andes? Then I say, who? And then to cut them short, I say, no, 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 it's my brother or it's a cousin. I change the subject and that's the end of it. If I could only forget about it, I would. People say that I should probably talk about it more, but I prefer to talk about something else. The most important thing that came out of our experience were the feelings that we live through every day. The friends, the, the arguments, to have a fight and then to give each other a hug. Just having to live as a very close-knit group. You could say we all had the same sense of survival and of friendship. We talked all the time about God and prayed to Him. We felt there must be a reason for our suffering, that He was asking something of us. We talked very intensely. We were very, very united, as though we actually felt Him near us. Each one of us remembers the, the Andes experience in a very personal way, maybe in a different way from the other ones. To some of the boys, the Andes can be a spiritual experience. To another boy, it can be the avalanche. To another one, it can be the cold. To another one, it can be the hunger. To another one, it can be the, the elation of the rescue. To another one, it can be the life after the Andes. Each one of us has a very personal way of approaching the Andes experience. And I think it should be that way. We are 16 survivors, 16 different people. And we see it in 16 different ways.
they see me as a hero, they call me a hero. But I deeply inside, and I know it, I'm not a hero. I didn't want to be on that crash. I didn't want to spend 72 of the most terrible days of my life in that place. I didn't want to feel the way I felt. I didn't want to lose my mother. I didn't want to lose my sister. I didn't want to lose my friends. I didn't want to be a hero. I didn't know a book was going to be written. I didn't know a movie was going to be made. I just wanted to get out of there. If that's being a hero, I can be called a hero. I don't want to be called a hero. I just wanted to leave.